Now, before I get started, I first wanted to thank you for being so patient. I just finished up my summer vacation effectively today. Uh, my upload schedule has been a little bit slow lately, but uh, you guys have been super patient and supportive. So thank you for that. And effective immediately, we're back to our weekly upload schedule. Secondly, um, I wanted to mention something that I'm hugely excited about. Clint Kearley from the YouTube channel Swatches just announced his brand new online digital art academy called Swatches Academy. And if you know Clint Kearley's work at all, and if you know what his professional background is, this is very big news. Um, I've been waiting for this for years. I've been waiting for him to make this announcement for years. I'll leave a link in the description below. Swa uh, Swatches Academy. And um, while we're on the topic, there's a multitude of top tier professional artists on the platform that have either recently or for years contribute their own course online as well. Ahmed al uh Mark Brunet's Brush Boost that he just announced very recently. Mark, uh, Marco Bucci just announced an online course very, very recently. Tyler Edlin, Anthony Jones's Robot Pencil, Bobby Chu's Schoolism. And the list goes on. It's not an exhaustive list. I'll leave a link in the description below for all of the above if you're researching online schools. And if there's any that I that I missed, let me know in the comments below. And I'll make a point of including that as well. Cool? So, that's a perfect segue into what I want to talk about today. <laughs> I want to talk about education. I want to talk about a lot of things to do with education. What type of education to pursue? Uh, what type of education is best for you? whether you're somebody who's brand new to the world of education or whether or not you're a seasoned pro who's been doing this for years, I'm sure there's something in this for everybody. However, this topic did not come from me. This topic came from a YouTuber that I just discover, discovered very recently, Kelsey Rodriguez, who I only discovered a couple of weeks ago because YouTube's algorithm sucks ass, right? And her channel's been absolutely exploding. She reached out to me a couple of weeks ago and said, hey, I'm a fellow YouTuber. Would you like to do a podcast together? And I was like, oh, Kelsey Rodriguez. And I went in, I checked it out. We did the podcast yesterday. She has not uploaded it yet. I think she might even have a couple of other podcasts before she uploads the one we recorded yesterday. So you're definitely going to want to subscribe for that. She covered a multitude of different topics, but there's one in particular that stuck in my head because it's something that's so particular to, well, my passion, my expertise, my job, my career, and that is teaching. And she asked me this kind of multifaceted question that that I really want to elaborate on. So full credit on this topic goes to Kelsey. I really feel that in my particular area of expertise, I can really offer you a lot of insight into this. I've taught thousands of students. I've taught in the traditional school system. I've worked professionally for big studios. I've worked for private studios. I've worked as a freelancer. I've worked as, as director for large groups, small groups. I've taught in big schools, small schools. I have my own online art school. I'm not saying this to flex. I'm saying this to let you know that I've had a chance to get to know and recognize a multitude of different personality types, professional types, artistic types. And one of the things I've come to discover is that when it comes to education, when it comes to what type of education to pursue, personality plays a very big role. Well, there's quite a few factors. There's personality, there's, there's demographics, there's age, there's nationality, there's financial situations, there's a whole multitude of different things. And it's not a one-stop shop. The t a, a, a type of education, a type of learning institution or learning platform might be ideal for one person and be terrible for somebody else. It really comes down to the individual, but you might not be aware of this. And I've seen artists in certain environments, in certain learning environments, thrive. And in exactly that same learning environment, I've seen other artists completely feel shafted or completely feel unremarkable about the experience. So I want to share this with you. I want to share my insight into this. The first part of Kelsey's question was, what type of art education should you get? Should you go to a traditional school with, in a classroom with people in the same room with you? Should you go to an online school and take classes with groups of people? Should you take private online mentorships like my own, like at Lucid Pixel? 
which one is best for the artist? Which ones should they pursue? And my answer to that has more to do with personality than anything else. And I've, my experience as a teacher does not just come from teaching. It also comes from observing the people around me. A really good example is my daughter, Emily, who incidentally just finished illustration in college. So congratulations, Emily. Uh, and is starting animation at the same school I studied animation at 20 years ago at Mel Hoppenheim School of Cinema at Concordia. And uh, um, during the COVID period, during the lockdown, Emily was traumatized by that whole experience. Being locked up was literally solitary confinement for her. She is a social butterfly. My younger sister, not that much younger, a couple of years, uh, my younger sister, Jessica, um, describes Emily as being a baby elephant in the sense that she will literally l shrivel up and die if she can't be around people. She needs her community. She needs her friends. She needs to cuddle and be in contact with people. She needs to socialize or she literally starts to fall apart. <laughs> She's very extroverted in that sense. During COVID, being locked up and having to take classes online and not being able to go to school into a brick and mortar classroom with her fellow students and friends was, was torturous for her. She loves going to school. She loves being in a classroom. She loves being around people. Any chance she has to be surrounded by people, she's happy. Well, at least people she likes, right? I would never recommend online learning for her as a first choice, as a supplementary choice, maybe later on in her life when she's a little bit older and she just wants to take a couple little courses here and there when she's already doing other things, sure. But as a 21 year old or a young 20s uh, student who's, who's very, very sociable, I would absolutely recommend you go to a brick and mortar school if you can. Now that said, there's a financial question that comes into this. Depending on where you're located, your education might be free. It might be subsidized to a very high degree, like in Canada. In Canada, uh, the majority of education is paid for by the government. Or in a place like, for instance, United States, where education is insultingly expensive. If you want to get into a school that has the, you know, the right where you're rubbing elbows with the right types of people and you're getting you're getting into the into that little niche crowd to get those types of jobs that you're looking for you're paying unreasonable amounts of money putting yourself in crippling lifelong debt something i've ranted about in early, in past art talks as well unless you have a very unless you unless you you were born into money or unless you you have access to substantial finances you just simply can't afford that and if you do decide to take out a loan for that, you're making a huge grave mistake financially that you're going to pay for for the rest of your life. What do you do in that particular situation where you need to be able to see people, you need to be able to socialize, but you can't afford these big hotshot schools? Well, what I would recommend is in the meantime, if you can, um, look for smaller schools. I taught a course at, I taught a couple of courses at Champlain College. It's kind of an interim teaching job. And there were little classes with four or five people. I was teaching night classes. This was right around the time my daughter Chloe was born. I remember coming home from, from teaching a nighttime class and my girlfriend went into labor immediately as soon as I got home and we ran straight to the hospital. That was a bit of an eventful night. Um, but um, it was fun. We were socializing. It wasn't overly big a class. So a lot of the students, there was about to be five or six of us. It was really a chance for us to get to know each other really well. They all came from different professional backgrounds. Um, it was a lot of fun and it was very, very affordable. And I, my, the quality of my education was not sacrificed. I always teach at the best capacity that I can teach. So my, it's not whether I teach in one school or another that my education, the what I teach changes. I'm always the same type of teacher. So if you can locate a good teacher in a more affordable location, that's one option for you. Okay. Another option is maybe you can't necessarily afford to go to a brick and mortar school at this particular point in time, but an online class that has people there right? Where you actually have access to other people. It's a classroom. 
that might be a very good location for you as well because at least you're kind of getting to know people and you might get to know different forums and different communities very often when you join these um when you join these classes you also get access to a community my online course has a private community as well um, where there's hundreds and hundreds of students that schmooze every single day it's a place where you can find the find some socializing as well and i think for somebody like you who's a much more social person i think you'd have a lot more fun and stay a lot more feel a lot more rejuvenated you'll feel like you've accomplished more and you'll feel more satisfied at the end of the day if you feel like you've had conversation with fellow people and then once your financial situation starts to improve or once your expertise gets good, good enough you can either a go to a more expensive you can afford to get get an education in a more expensive school and or b you've got some professional skills and you get yourself a job in a studio there you go so sometimes you have to take a backdoor backdoor approach to getting that human contact um, and sometimes you can just afford it off the bat in which case good on you however as much as Emily is a social butterfly. She's a baby elephant who needs who needs her cuddles every single day. A lot of her friends aren't. I love her friends to pieces. They are the funnest, most interesting, amazing friends you could ever you could ever ask for as far as that goes. I love her friends to pieces. But they're very introverted. Most of her friends are very introverted. They they like their own little thing. And we were we all went out for lunch the other day. It was a big table of us, me and all of her her and all of her friends. And uh Emily was saying she was the only one who suffered during COVID. She was the only one who suffered. Every one of her friends were like, Mal, this is cool, man. If it could be like this all the time, I'm great. <laughs> they love being alone. In fact, being in large social environments is exhausting. And at the end of the day, you don't feel rejuvenated. You need to, you need to sleep for three days just to come down from all that overwhelm. And I've experienced this not only not only just people in general that I've met in my in my personal life because I met many artists inside and outside of the school environment but also in classrooms and in when I was teaching in, when I teach taught at the CJ of Montreal for instance these are larger classes 20 30 students sometimes and in those classrooms some people are just absolutely they're absolute entertainers and they're yapping and they're cracking jokes and they're having fun and they're, they're schmoozing. I even, there was even this couple, this young couple at one point that kept trying to make out in my class. I kept telling him to, <laughs> can you get off his lap and go sit down at your desk, please? Like get a room for God's sakes, right? And, uh, but just people that were super sociable and comfortable, other people who would just stay in the corner and they'd be very quiet all the time. And as a teacher, I'm always seeing that. I'm recognizing that. One of my frustrations as a teacher was the fact that I couldn't cater to every individual all the time, you know, that not to, not to the extent that I wanted to. This is why I started a private mentorship in the first place. For people like that, I have some advice for you. I have some advice for you. Um, if you're more introverted, if you're somebody who's who's more to yourself, that prefers your you're in your best creative space when you're on your own and stuff like that, uh, you're not the minority. Artists are very often introverts. It's our private little creative world. We're self-motivated very often. We're very unique in that sense. We are creative people. Creative equals uniqueness, is it not? So not all artists need that, that social aspect all the time. A lot of artists just prefer to have their own little quiet time to themselves. However, being entirely on your own all the time is not only not healthy it's not going to help you professionally and me saying that out loud to you might put a bit of a pit in your stomach and make you think yeah i know i know people keep telling me that all the time um however there's a way of doing it in a way that's not traumatizing the the way i like to describe it is cats versus dogs I personally am a cat person, in case you were curious. In fact, I'm not just a cat person. I'm, an, I'm obsessive over cats, <laughs> as a lot of my students know. And um, cats and dogs are very different when it came, comes to their social, how they behave socially. A dog, um, when you introduce dogs to each other, you open up the, the 
the dog park and you let them all run in and start sniffing each other. Go, 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 go sniff, go, go sniff his ass, get to know him well, right? That's how dogs socialize. However, if you do that with a cat, it's traumatizing, right? You, you, if you take a cat, if you take a new kitten, which I'm planning on getting soon, if you get a new kitten and you bring him into a house with a, with a cat that's already established, that's their domain, and you just put them next to each other, you're guaranteeing trauma and you're guaranteeing conflict, right? So what do you do? You do it gently. You bring them in a separate room together. You close the door at first. You get them used to, you get their smell into different things. You let them kind of sniff each other through the house so they start to get familiar with their smell, but in a safe, separated environment. You let them have ownership of their own space. And then you open the door a little bit. You let them peek at each other through the door from a distance. Sometimes this takes weeks, right? And then slowly but surely, you, you slowly wean into when they can finally be introduced and you let them gently introduce each other once they've gotten somewhat accustomed to each other's presence and smell in that space. And that's how you introduce cats in, a, in it the proper way. That said, you'd think, well, why do that in the first place? Just have an only cat. Well, yeah. A lot of people do have only, I have an only cat right now. Link, my, my beloved Himalayan, he's, he's an only cat. But I do believe that cats should have companionship. I do believe that cats should have friends. I watch a lot of Jackson Galaxy. I'm, I'm, I binge on his stuff all the time. And I agree with everything he says. I love that guy to pieces. And I do want to get him. I'm probably going to get a kitten soon. Being completely alone is, well, lonely. And it's important for you to find somebody to connect to. And when you're somebody who's a little bit more introverted, you're not going to walk into a room and be the life of the party, but you definitely need to have somebody in your life. You definitely know, need to know how to create a bond with somebody, with a small group of people. And it's that dynamic, it's that slow approach that you can use in your own life as well. So if you're somebody that finds yourself generally and to a healthy degree introverted, you need to understand one thing and that's you need companionship to grow professionally. You cannot build a career locked up in a cage. You can't do that. People need to discover who you are. However, they have to discover you on your terms. They have to discover you as an individual, as somebody who creates intimate, personal relationships with different people. You're not the type of person who walks into the room and just runs the show, right? So start with a private mentorship, a one-on-one. -on -one right? Where you're a bit shyer, you have your own little quirks to your personality and stuff like that. You want to hand pick that teacher who you feel safe with, where you feel that they communicate in a way that feels safe to you, that they're not going to be elitist and demanding on you and make you and belittle you and make you feel like shit. So you want to hand pick somebody that you feel comfortable and safe with. And you start to establish a relationship, get to know a fellow artist, a fellow professional, um, somebody who you can share your passion with, somebody who you can communicate your passion with, and that relationship is going to feed your skills. And it's going to slow, you're going to start to, in a very cat analogy type of way, it start, it's going to start to get you familiar with the smell of artists. That could be so misinterpreted depending on where, if you walk into this conversation now, Adam said, I need to smell other artists. What the hell is he talking about, right? It's all about pheromones. But um, yeah, you're kind of familiarizing yourself just like any other shy animal, shy mammal. You're, you're slowly weaning yourself into, into getting comfortable with some other artist's presence in your life. You're not just somebody who's locked up in your little room, in your own private little world, without any clue on how to reach out. And once that happens, the next step might be going to, joining a slightly more social group, maybe a private mentorship or maybe some private brick and mortar school, um, like where I taught at Champlain College, for instance, we had these little classrooms of students and stuff like that, where um, it's little groups of people, little online groups of people. So now you're hearing people laugh, you're hearing people that are sharing in the conversation. You might throw in your little comment every now and then, or you might want to be quiet for the first five classes. And you're slowly weaning yourself into a bigger and bigger community of artists. And in doing so, you're starting to make your face familiar. 
being familiar is very, very important. If you have two people in the same room together, if one's a stranger and one's not a stranger, but they both have equal talent, the person who's not a stranger, the person who's familiar, who's, who's, who other people recognize as being, yeah, I, I know that person, I've seen them online, or I know that person, I was in a class with them, that scientifically, social scientifically speaking, makes your chances of getting employed far higher, right? It's why certain people get elected. They might not be the best pick, but at least I know them over this guy. I have no idea who that guy is. So I don't feel as safe with that choice over this one. Okay. I'm not trying to make it a political conversation, but this is, this is fact. This is how we feel as people. So if you see somebody online, if you see somebody in a classroom over and over again, and then you see them in a professional context, you're far more likely to approach them and offer them opportunities first. This is how people behave in a social environment, right? Then slowly but surely, maybe you want to go out to a public event. Maybe you want to start presenting yourself at a comic convention, some kind of Comic-Con or the Otakuton, which are having, which is going on right now in Montreal, the anime, anime festival, right? And maybe you want to buy a booth, buy a table there. What type of person are you going to be at this Comic-Con? Well, I go to Comic-Cons all the time. If I go out with my friend Jimmy, he's like Mr. Social. He's just yapping everybody up. He's, he doesn't let people pass his table without grabbing them by the arm and saying, come chat with me, right? He's that kind of a guy. And um, there's other people. He's, in fact, I would argue he's completely surrounded by people. The, the gross majority of artists that are at, that are at Comic-Cons and stuff like that are generally people that are just sitting very privately doing their little sketches at the table. They're looking down. <laughs> they're, they're kind of afraid to socialize and stuff. And then some people kind of quietly walk up to them and go, hey, what are you doing? And they go, oh, I'm just working on drawing. And then the person kind of walks up and warms up to them and they start to chat. Making that eye contact, meeting that person, but doing it on your own terms, slowly weaning yourself into a more and more social environment is slowly but surely making connections for you. It's getting you out there. And that is monumentally a better tactic for success than sitting alone in your closet and not doing any socializing whatsoever. Here's another good example of that. I can attest to a private contact with individuals. My school, my mentorship is a private mentorship. It's one on one. And I've had plenty of opportunities to start. I could start teaching classes of people right now if I wanted to. I have actively chosen not to, not because I'm introverted. I'm not introverted at all. I'm, I'm quite extroverted. I'm generally the person who's running events and stuff like that. But because I recognize artists as individuals and when I was teaching in the school system, one of my frustrations was the fact that artists who were more introverted didn't get didn't didn't have the time to get that attention they needed and i wanted to make sure that everybody that i teach everybody who comes my way gets all the time they need to be able to find themselves and discover themselves and grow artistically and find the best way of learning things it's the old master's way right having a small group of people or a private mentorship to learn with i do it for that very reason because more than half, at least more than half, maybe 60, 70% of my students are very introverted. I, yeah, I would say, yeah, more, more of my students are introverted than extroverted. Now that I think about it, I'd say there's only a small handful of my students that are very sociable and big smiles and, you know, all that kind of stuff. A lot of people are just quiet, super sweet, super friendly. We make great, we become great friends at the end of it, but very introverted. Okay. Now, the last part of this is money, costs of education. Um, should you, and this is another question that Kelsey had asked me, should you do as much as you can on your own for free and then pursue an art education once you kind of hit a brick wall and you've got a little bit more money? And or should you invest in signing up for a mentorship right away? Again, I would say this is, well, this is, this is both a personality answer and a financial answer. If you are broke, then you're broke at a very, very convenient time. 
there is a crap ton of great content out there. There's you know, a lot of free content. Look at, you know, go on, go on like Borodante's channel, go on Clint Kearley's channel, go on Ahmed al channel, go on Tyler Edlin's channel, um, go on Online Art Academy, uh, Matt Kors Control Paint, Darkin, uh, uh, Trent Kanyuga, all of these artists, a plethora of artists that have tons and tons and tons of absolutely masterful free stuff out there on their channel. Incredibly generous artists, very talented artists that are very candid with their expertise. And I have learned countless things as a professional just watch, binging on their stuff. And I binge on all of their stuff all the time. I live on art channels all the time. If you can't afford to get an art education, and but you really are desperate to get an art education, maybe there's just no schools nearby or no schools nearby that are affordable. Yes, I would recommend getting as far as you can completely for free before you before you even consider taking a mentorship. And when and if the only time you should really pursue a mentorship is when you feel you've hit a literal brick wall with your learning. You just don't know where to go. And you need help at this point. You need some kind of structure. You need you need to you need to share your work with a professional who can really deconstruct it professionally and say, okay, this, you need to work here, 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 and here. And this is how you're gonna kind of give yourself a well-rounded education. This is focus more on this. Don't worry about this so much. This is more of a priority. And get that kind of professional feedback you're looking for. Um, but only when you hit that brick wall. In fact, hitting a brick wall is very often the best time to do anything. I started my mentorship because I hit a brick wall with my my opinion of the educational system to a certain degree. The politics and the structure of the traditional educational system really got on my nerves. So I saw that quote, market gap, as Kelsey, as Kelsey Rodriguez would say, and uh, I, I tackled it. But I spent many years learning on my own as well. Absolutely. Now, another facet of this is personality. The type of person that I would recommend approaching education on a personal level um, is somebody who is very good at structuring yourself artistically. A really good example is actually one of my former students who now runs his online learning platform, Artwad, Antonio Stapertz. Very successful um, art platform who's incredibly self-motivated and incredibly, like, like, like uncommonly organized and structured as a student, as a learner. He's very good at structuring himself artistically and his growth was, well, testament to that structure that he went from absolutely, he was, he started with me as a guy who never drew. He said, Adam, we're starting from scratch. Give it to me. And I went, cool. And we started from the foundations. One year later, he's working professionally. That is almost unheard of. And only a minute proportion of that is thanks to me. I only got I only got the ball rolling. He did all the hard work himself. But somebody like that is very good at taking very, very little information that they find online and finding structure with it, but not everybody can pull that off. Artists are very often very organic in their learning process. There's a lot of back and forth. There's a lot of discovery. There's a lot of banging your head against the wall. That's, I'd say, arguably the more common way that artists learn. So if you're somebody that is very, very structured and or can find that kind of structure, yeah, learning on your own, sometimes you can get all the way to professional without ever even taking an online course. It's like some guys that, you know, they're, they're, they're body beautiful just because they have great genetics, you know, even though they barely ever go to the gym. Some people just, some people just have those genetics, right? However, if you're not, and if you're somebody who finds that unless you have somebody giving you that structure, unless you're, unless you can, unless there's somebody who can, um, who needs somebody to give you a template to learn with. Otherwise you just kind of never make any kind of progress, which is also very common for artists. I would recommend looking for an affordable foundational course. And well, any of the online teachers that I mentioned before, any, any of those teachers that you can find in the description below, every single one of those artists are solid, fundamental teachers. They know, they know exactly what matters and exactly what kind of obstacles you need to challenge, which things to prioritize artistically, and they can offer you that daily structure. And that during those courses, while taking those courses, you have 
actionable things you can do to get better at art that are not wasting your time. They're not too idealistic. They're very well-rounded. They're giving you the tool set to learn. And that will get the ball rolling. Sometimes that's enough. But for a lot of people, you hit that once that mentorship stops, unless you have something else directly following it or unless you've planned something, that's where very often an artist can start to lose touch with that motivation because they need that community to keep them motivated. And that's where, again, where Antonio Stapertz and Artwad came in. The foundation of his, of his platform was, what do you do between mentorships? What do you do? How do you continue to keep yourself active and growing? And that's exactly the, quote, market gap that Antonio filled. And well, <laughs> it was a needed market cap because his 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 business is is absolutely succeeding. It's taken off. It was a very smart move and he knew it and everybody else knew it too, right? So you have those constant accesses to resources. By the time you've reached that point, what at a certain point, you won't need to worry about that anymore. Because once you reach a certain skill level artistically, once you've got that portfolio, once you've kind of found your niche and found your brand and you've got your style and your fundamentals are nice and solid professionally, whether it takes you two weeks or whether it takes you 10 years, it doesn't matter. Everybody, art, art, every artist looks at, learns at different speeds. At that point, either A, you're self-employed, B, you're working in a studio, your employer is going to be giving you work to do. Your client is going to give you work to do. So your job is going to continue to c contribute to that structure. However, if you're more of an independent artist and you're more self-motivated, maybe you'll want to work for something like, you know, like for a, a, something like what Clint Curley does at Magic the Gathering or Fantasy Flight Games or some independent freelance work where um, you can build your own brand and sell your own products. Some people absolutely thrive at that kind of stuff. They're really good at doing their own thing. I'm one of those people. I'm really good at doing my thing. In fact, I prefer doing my thing and structuring my own workflow over having other people tell me what to do because I like being in my bubble. I like being in my creative little world because that's where I find growth and, and satisfaction as far as that goes. So, um, when it comes to the financial side of things, if you can afford it and you need that kind of structure, I would recommend take a class. If you're a little bit more introverted, then take a private class one-on-one -on -one, and then work your way up from there. Okay. However, if you're somebody who's very structured, self-motivated, uh, and you're very resourceful, you know how to research things online, I have no qualms saying do everything completely on your own. You've got tons and tons of free resources online. The world's your oyster if you know how to navigate that. But if you don't, don't beat yourself up about it. And of course, if you're a social butterfly and you're a baby elephant, just like my, my sweet Emily, then get yourself in as big a classroom as quickly as humanly possible or you're going to shrivel up and die a miserable and lonely death. And on that cheery note, I love you all with all my heart and happy painting. Take care.